during World War I, German airman Peter Strasser commanded the fleet of Zeppelins that flew to Britain and carried out the first systematic bombing of civilians from the sky. We who strike the enemy where his heart beats have been slandered as baby killers and murderers of women. What we do is repugnant to us too, but necessary, very necessary. A soldier cannot function without the factory worker, the farmers and all the other providers behind them. Nowadays, there's no such animal as a non-combatant. Peter Strasser would not live to see the end of the war. His Zeppelin would be shot out of the sky. But already in 1915, he knew a dark secret. War in the 20th century would be a new kind of war. Total war. This program was made possible by a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities and by the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations. Funding for this program was also provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by annual financial support from viewers like you. Early on April 25th, 1915, British, French, Australian, and New Zealand troops began landing on the Turkish peninsula of Gallipoli. Their aim, to knock Germany's ally, Turkey, out of the war. Opposing them, on cliffs overlooking the shore, was a smaller Turkish force, From his battleship, the Allied commander, Sir Ian Hamilton, watched the spectacle unfold. The day was just breaking over the jagged hills. The landing of the lads from the south was in full swing. We could see boatloads making for the land, swarms trying to straighten themselves out along the shore. God, one would think, cannot see them at all, or he would put a stop to this sort of panorama altogether. The peninsula chosen for the assault guarded the entrance to the Dardanelles Straits. Four weeks earlier, the British Navy had failed to open up this route to the Black Sea and its ally, Russia. Now it was the army's turn. An amphibious expedition is the most difficult operation of warfare, especially if you're sending it against something like the Gallipoli Peninsula, which must be one of the most defensible pieces of geography in the world. What you've got is a very few beaches and then high cliffs, overhanging cliffs, towering hills, an absolutely ideal place for a defending force to place itself. By mid-afternoon on the first day, 8,000 Allied soldiers were ashore. The outnumbered Turks began to pull back. 
until they encountered Lieutenant Colonel Mustafa Kamal. I said to the men who were running away, you cannot run away from the enemy. We have no ammunition, they said. If you haven't got ammunition, you have your bayonets. And shouting to the men, I made them fix their bayonets and lie down on the ground. I said, I don't order you to attack. I order you to die. Because of Kamal, the Turkish troops stood and fought, allowing reinforcements to reach Gallipoli. But the price for Turkey was high. They knew they would die in about three minutes, but they showed not the least dismay. There was no wavering. Those who could read prepared to enter paradise with the Koran in their hands. Those who could not recited the martyr's prayer as they went forward. From his ship, Hamilton could do nothing but order his men to hold the narrow beaches they occupied. There is nothing for it but to dig yourselves right in and stick it out. You have got through the difficult business. Now you have only to dig, dig, dig until you are safe. It's not really an episode in a great European war between industrial powers at all. It's the old British imperial tradition. And once it started not working, people decided, but good heavens, British prestige is at stake, that the whole Muslim world will feel that we've been humiliated. Gallipoli, which was to have been a quick victory, instead became a miniature version of the Western Front, a war of trenches and stalemate. As we approach the shore, what an aspect opens up before us. Valleys and valleys, scrub-covered hillsides. Men getting about everywhere and looking all the world like ants. But above all, the thing that meets, or rather hits the eye, is the number of dugouts. The whole landscape is covered with them. It looks for all the world like a mining camp. Cyril Lawrence was one of the Anzacs, Australian and New Zealand soldiers, who went ashore at Gallipoli one month into the campaign. The trenches are totally different to what I expected. It is sure death to put your head up to look around. Even the periscope mirrors, measuring three inches square at most, are picked off one after the other. When the Turks charge, they usually cry, Allah, Allah. And our boys reply, come on, you bastards, we'll give you Allah. And from the frequent use of this word, poor old Turk wants to know if bastard is one of our gods. At some places, the trenches were very close. They could hear the voice of each other. They could hear the Turks singing songs in the evening. They ask questions at each other. Why are you fighting? Why are you here? It's very interesting. I mean, can you imagine a war during the eight and a half uh, months? They were fighting. Thousands of soldiers were killed on both sides, and still they were not hating each other. 
The Turks were fighting for their homeland and for their faith. One soldier was Hassan Item, a teacher and law student before the war. My dearest mother, I can see a line of soldiers washing their clothes in the stream near the emerald green hillside. One soldier with a beautiful voice is saying prayers. I opened my hands, looked up at the heavens and said, God of Turks, master of the birds, the sheep, the leaves, the mountains, God, all this soldier wants is to keep this land from the British and the French. Grant me this wish. Please, make the bayonets of these soldiers sharp and destroy our enemies. By summer, Hamilton realized that he lacked the forces to take the high ground. A badly planned campaign and a badly equipped army had nowhere to go. The war office urged me to throw my brave troops yet once more against the machine guns in redoubts. To do it on the cheap. To do it without asking for the shells that give the attack a sporting chance. People slur over my appeal for the shells and yet continue to urge us on as if we were hanging back. With summer came a plague of flies. Disease soon followed, as Cyril Lawrence noted in his diary. Daily now, the men are getting weaker. If only those at home, fed on lies as they are, could see how the men really are. Weak as kittens. One mass of sores and yet as undaunted in spirit as ever. But that spirit can't last forever. Soon, these English idiots will have ruined one of the finest bodies of men that ever fought. Once, I used to worship the British soldier as a hero and was proud to be a Briton. But jigger me if I am now. For we see nothing but British blundering, boasting, bullying, bluff and blasting failure and doing nothing. God, but it's disheartening. Both Hamilton and the British government were at a loss, but refused to abandon the campaign. The army clung to their strip of sand through the fall and into the winter. This morning when I awoke, it was to find the old place coated with white snow. Cold. The trenches covered in snow, men dying where they stand on post, frozen stiff and dead. Yet they can give us only half a cup of half cold tea per day. In November, Lord Kitchener, the British Secretary of State for War, took a first-hand look at Gallipoli. He declared the campaign a wastage of officers and men. In January 1916, after suffering a quarter of a million men killed, wounded, or missing, the Allies secretly withdrew. Hamilton was blamed for the failure. 
Relieved of his command, his military career was finished. The hero of Gallipoli, Mustafa Kemal, became Ataturk, the father of modern Turkey. The young law student, Hassan Etem, was among Turkey's quarter of a million casualties. He died only days after writing his letter home. The Australian, Cyril Lawrence, survived Gallipoli and next saw action in France, where he came to hold the British Army in somewhat higher regard. The unlikely encounter of Turk and Australian on the cliffs of Gallipoli was grim confirmation that the Great War was becoming the First World War. By 1915, nearly every family had at least one loved one who had marched off to battle. Nine million men would never return. When war was declared, 21-year-old Vera Britton had called it the most thrilling day of her life. Vera was a student at Oxford University. She was also deeply in love. Her fiancé, Roland Leighton, had joined the army. So had her brother Edward and their close friend, Victor Richardson. The Three Musketeers, Vera called them. The war, we decided, came harshest of all upon us who were young. The middle-aged and old had known their period of joy. Whereas upon us, catastrophe had descended just in time to deprive us of that youthful happiness of which we had believed ourselves entitled. To this constant anxiety for Roland's life was added a new fear, that the war would come between us, putting a barrier of indescribable experience between men and the women whom they loved. Worse than saying goodbye for Vera was staying passively at her home outside London, wondering and worrying, as each day brought the possibility of dreaded news about Roland. Ordinary household sounds became a torment. The clock marking off each hour of dread struck into the tension with the shattering effect of a thunderclap. Every ring at the door suggested a telegram. Every telephone call a long distance message giving bad news. Wanting to contribute, Vera tried knitting for soldiers, but quickly became bored. Women get all the dreariness of war, she complained, and none of its exhilaration. She decided to leave Oxford and become a nurse. In a surgical ward, I had told Roland, the nurses hardly occupy the silent-footed gliding role which they always do in storybooks. The mixture of gramophones and people shouting or groaning after an operation relieves you of the necessity of being quiet. They were blaring, blatant gramophones. Though the men found them consoling, perhaps because they subdued more sinister noises. They seemed to me to add a strident grotesqueness to the cold, dark evenings of hurry and pain.
As Christmas 1915 neared, Vera Britton received good news. It was a hastily written note from her fiancé, Roland. Shall be home on leave, it read. Land Christmas Day. Two days later, the phone rang. Believing that I was at last to hear the voice for which I had been waiting, I dashed joyously into the corridor. But the message was not from Roland. It was not to say that he had arrived home that morning, but to tell me that he had died of wounds on December 23rd. Roland, I reflected bitterly, was now part of the corrupt clay into which war had transformed the fertile soil of France. He would never again know the smell of a wet evening in early spring. It was a bitter gray afternoon. I wondered however I was going to get through the weary remainder of life. I was only at the beginning of my twenties. I might have another 40, perhaps even 50 years to live. The next to die was her friend Victor. Vera clung to the hope that the last of the musketeers, her brother Edward, would survive. He was killed in the last year of the war. Edward, like Roland, had promised me that if a life existed beyond the grave, he would somehow come back and make me know of it. I'd thought that of the two, Roland, with his reckless determination, would be the more likely to trespass from the infinite across the boundaries of the tangible. But he had sent no sign, and Edward sent none. Nor did I expect one. I knew now that death was the end, and that I was quite alone. There was no hereafter, no Easter morning, no meeting again. I walked in a darkness, a dumbness, a silence, which no beloved voice would penetrate. Vera Britton's memoirs remain among the most moving testaments to the lost generation of the Great War. She shared her sorrows, she said, to show that war was not glamour or glory, but abysmal grief and purposeless waste. The manpower of Europe was not enough to satisfy the appetite of the war. It also required drafts from the empires of Britain and France. Millions answered the call of imperial loyalty. One newspaper appealed to Africans this way. The present war is a world war. Without you, your white comrades cannot do anything. Everyone who loves his country and respects the British government, join this war without hesitation. One who came forward and joined the French army was a West African Kande Kamara. He told his story in later years. He was the son of a village chief who volunteered to prove himself a warrior. It was a decision that upset his father, who saw no reason to die for white men. Please forgive me. I'm simply doing this for our house. If I die, I die as a man. I'll simply be buried as a man. Tens of thousands of Africans were shipped off to Europe. Some served as laborers, 
others as soldiers. Kande Kamara never forgot his passage. Confined in the lower decks of a transport ship, his six-day voyage quickly turned from adventure to nightmare. Some were getting very seasick. Some were vomiting. The smell of the ship, the oil, the guck was too unbearable. Some people didn't know where they were going, even why they were fighting. A lot of people spread the rumor that we would never come back, that we were going to be sold as slaves. Some said, if the ship sinks, who gives a damn? Because we're all going to die anyway. After arriving in France, Kamara's unit began training. As always, turning recruits into soldiers began not with fighting, but marching. What Kamara called parades. When we arrived at Bordeaux, we were sent directly for parades. After resting, we went back for more parades. There were all kinds of nationalities. There were Fulas, Karanko, Yolonkas, Bambaros, Sanufis, Kese, Toms, Becerra, and a lot more. Kamara was just as impressed by seeing an airplane for the first time, what he called a steamship that flies in the air. But at the front, Kamara was puzzled by orders to dig what he called gutters, where soldiers hid for weeks. The fighting, which went on both day and night, seemed a strange way of waging battle. You couldn't hold your teeth because of all your trembling because during those days, everything was going boom. It was terrible and hard. In the white man's war, you never say I'm thirsty. You never say I'm hungry. You fight and fight and fight until your heart tells you you're afraid. Precise casualty numbers for Africans do not exist. As many as a quarter of a million men were killed, wounded, or missing. But their sacrifices brought them little respect from their colonial rulers or the enemy in the opposing trenches. We were black and we were nothing. Because of the color of our skins, the Germans called us boots. This hurt every black man because they actually underestimated us, disgraced and dishonored us. Kamara survived the fighting and returned home after the war to his tribe. He had once admired the power and might of Europe. But what he found on the battlefields of France made him question what Western civilization had to offer.
The guns out there are roaring fast. The bullets fly like rain. The aeroplanes are coveting. They go and come again. The bombs talk loud. The mines crash out. No trench their might withstands. Who helped them all to do their job? The girls with yellow hands. As men marched off to war, women marched off to work. The result was a dramatic but temporary change in the workforce of every fighting nation. But of all the professions women entered, none was more important than shell-making. In Britain, one million women poured into munitions factories. 28,000 women worked here, on Warren Lane, in southeast London. The Woolwich Royal Arsenal was Britain's largest. This, too, was a battleground. The first time you go around, you think, what an interesting place. Then the evil smell becomes more noticeable. The particles of acid land on your face and make you nearly mad, feeling like pins and needles. Gabriel West knew the dangers of working in a shell factory. She first ran a factory canteen, and then shocked her father by joining the newly formed Women's Police Service. Her assignment was to maintain order inside factories. The fumes often mean 16 or 18 casualties a night. You're blind and speechless by the time you escape. War work was dangerous, laborious, heavy, dirty. Women were, you know, blown up in powder factories um, in accidents with TNT, and there were several hundred uh, deaths on both on in both France and Britain. Um, just due to explosions alone. An exploding shell was a quick way to die. But there was a slower way. TNT poisoning. The first signs were like a common cold. Nasal stuffiness, headaches, and coughs. But continued exposure caused symptoms far from ordinary as a young worker named Caroline Webb was to discover. It was all bright ginger, all our front hair. And all our faces were bright yellow. They used to call us canaries. This doctor, he was looking at us girls one day and he'd say, half you girls will never have babies. And the other half are too sick. God help you. Seeking adventure, Caroline Webb had left her job as a dressmaker for employment first as a shell filler, then bullet maker. We were kids, she later said. We didn't bother whether we were blown to bits or not. Sometimes when we come upon our little train, it will be all packed with different people. And there'd be all the officers sitting there. Some of them used to look at us as if we were insects. And others used to mutter, well, they're doing their bit. We said, 
Well, we don't mind dying for our country. One of the things that women gained as a result of going into the war factories, aside from decent wages, was um, recognition, a sense that what they did mattered, and that it mattered centrally to the most important thing that was going on at that time, which was winning this war. Winning the war required mountains of shells and bullets made by women. Some hoped that the new openings created by the war would continue afterwards. But when the war ended, so did most opportunities for the girls with yellow hands. No end of ZEP excitements lately. A few weeks ago, we heard distant guns in the middle of the night. We looked up, and there was the ZEP so low you could see the cars hanging underneath. My word, we did scoot. There was tremendous din of firing, and things began to patter on the roof. I thought I was dead that time. Winning the war meant breaking the will to go on, of soldiers and civilians alike. Zeppelins first appeared over London in 1915. A favorite target, Gabriel West recorded in her diary, was Woolwich. We were just going back to our hut when we heard wild yells of cheering so the whole sky turned red. Then we saw the Zepp in flames to the north. All the workers in the arsenal roared and shrieked. All the boys sang Tipperary, and all the neighbors scattered about congratulating each other. As the first Zeppelins bombed London, the rules of engagement were also changing on the battlefield. The German army introduced a new weapon in hopes of breaking the stalemate on the Western Front. Poison gas. First came chlorine, the yellow gas, then came the green gas, then came mustard gas, the granddaddy of napalm. And each of these had appalling effects on men who were trapped in the trench system. It didn't break the defensive lines. It made the level of suffering much worse than it had been before. The British soldier and poet, Wilfred Owen, witnessed one man's death from gas poisoning. In one of his most famous poems, he captured another dimension of total war. Gas, gas, quick boys, an ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmet just in time. But someone still was yelling out and stumbling and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light as under a green sea, I saw him drowning. In all my dreams, before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If in some smothering dreams, you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in, and watch the white eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face like a devil's sick of sin. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth-corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud of vile, incurable sores on innocent tongues. My friend, 
You would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory the old lie. Dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. Whether it was sweet and noble to die for one's country also became a question for civilians traveling by sea. The British Navy was blockading Germany. The Germans responded by declaring that all ships sailing to Britain were at risk of being sunk without warning by their submarines, the U-boat. On May 1st, 1915, the Lusitania, the world's finest luxury liner, set sail from New York for Britain. On board were nearly 2,000 passengers and crew. The ship crossed the Atlantic without incident. But on the evening of May 6th, the ship's captain received warnings of enemy submarines off the coast of Ireland. Margaret Rhonda was a first-class passenger who hailed from one of Wales' most prominent families. We were, most of us, very fully conscious of the risk we were running. We used to discuss our chances. I can't help hoping, said one girl, that we get some sort of thrill going up the channel. My father and I had just come out of the dining room after lunching. I think we may stay up on deck tonight to see if we get our thrill, he said. I had no time to answer. I saw that the water had come over onto the deck. We were not, as I had thought, 60 feet above the sea. We were already under the sea. The ship sank, and I was sucked right down with her. When I came to the surface, I remember looking round at the sun and pale blue sky and calm sea and wondering whether I had reached heaven without knowing it and devoutly hoped I hadn't. Margaret Rhonda survived the sinking, but 1,200 men, women and children drowned, including 128 Americans. The German Navy cast a medal for the men who sank the ship. By 1915, everyone became a soldier, one way or another. Countless children were exposed to the violence of war. They fled from their homes. They feared being gassed. And they were bombed from the skies. But there was another way they became part of total war, as propaganda. The most violent images, the most shocking images of the war propaganda aimed at the children are, you can find them in postcards, for example. You can find a very young baby of less than one year old with a gun in the hands going out from an egg and asking if there are some bushes, some Germans somewhere, because you want to kill them. You consider that a baby uh, less than one year old uh, has to be a fighter and has to kill uh, the enemy. 
that is, I think, impossible to stand. But that was the reality of the propaganda of these times. This is the house that Jack built. This is the bomb that fell out of the house that Jack built. This is the HUD that dropped the bomb that fell on the house that Jack built. This is the gun that killed the HUD that dropped the bomb that fell on the house that Jack built. Propaganda flourished in many forms, especially in cinema. Movie makers had a field day with stories of German atrocities. In the film, The Little American, America's sweetheart, Mary Pickford, survived German torpedoes, German brutality, and a German firing squad. Total war demonized the enemy. It demanded all the resources of a nation. It transformed civilians into targets. But in 1915, total war went a terrible step further. Turkey in the year 1915, war had two faces. One was a heroic stand at Gallipoli. The other, a brutal plan of mass murder. In northeastern Turkey, hundreds of thousands of civilians were to die. The war was the excuse. Ethnic cleansing of Christian Armenians out of lands controlled by Islamic Turkey was the true intention. The presence in the northeast of the country of a thriving, cultured, and relatively wealthy community of Armenians was a difficulty to Turks long before the First World War. It became a political and strategic threat when the war broke out because of the place of Armenians in the Russian Empire. However, most Armenians, two million of them living in the Turkish Empire, were no threat whatsoever. Only hours after the first Allied soldiers stepped onto the beaches of Gallipoli, 200 Armenian leaders were rounded up and executed. The Turks then began ridding themselves of entire communities. Men, women, and children were marched off into the desert. The Turkish government had said that the men in prison would be released and allowed to go with their families. Some were simple enough to believe this and to think that they would be allowed to settle down in some other place where they would begin life all over again. Leslie Davis, the American consul in the remote eastern province of Harput, had heard rumors of crimes committed by Turkish soldiers and marauding bands. To see for himself, he hired a guide and traveled by horseback into the desert. Greater misery could not be imagined. The dead and the dying are everywhere. Two or three small children may be seen weeping over the dead body of their mother. Other children are lying curled upon the ground, dead or in convulsions. One sees dead bodies now in all directions and on every road. The whole country is one vast slaughterhouse. 
Davis's reports were not the only ones. Other eyewitnesses also complained of the killings. One was a young medic in the German army, Armin Wegner. Against orders, smuggling in his camera, he visited a refugee camp filled with survivors. In the last few days, I have taken numerous photographs on the penalty of death. I do not doubt for a moment that I'm committing an act of treason. And yet, I am inspired by the knowledge that I have helped these poor people in some small way. What Armin Wegner captured in these photos was a visual record of the first genocide of the 20th century. Hunger, death, despair showed at me from all sides. I was seized by terror and hurried out of the camp, my heart pounding. I was overcome by dizziness, as if earth were collapsing on both sides of me into an abyss. ways, it shows that the old idea that war is politics by other means is outdated in the 20th century. War is hatred by other means. And in this case, hatred means extermination. The First World War was the biggest war ever to date. The Second World War was bigger still. It's no accident in my mind that both of them were marked by genocide. It is the logic of the brutalization of total war. A few found a way to tell what had happened to them. One Armenian woman smuggled out a message in a shoe. I seize this opportunity of bringing to your ears the cry of agony, which goes out from the survivors of the terrible crisis through which we are passing. They are exterminating our nations. Perhaps this will be the last cry from Armenia that you will hear. To this day, the Turkish government denies the genocide. Estimates vary as to how many Armenians died. Some cite the figure of half a million. Others, one million. Whatever the number, the Armenian Genocide was one of the darkest chapters of the Great War. In years to come, Armin Wegner would send a letter to Adolf Hitler in defense of the Jewish people. It was a plea which fell on deaf ears, for Hitler had learned a completely different lesson. He told his inner circle, who remembers the Armenian massacres today?
This program was made possible by a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities and by the Arthur Vining Davis Foundations. Funding for this program was also provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by annual financial support from viewers like you. To order a video cassette of this program or the complete eight-part series of The Great War and the Shaping of the 20th Century, call PBS Video at 1-800-328-PBS-1.